and welcome to WRPB and WRPB Studios. So, if you watch me, you'll recognize the gentleman next to me. He's one of my favorite guests because he has such an impressive story. And I always thought my stories were impressive, okay? And the things I've been through and the chances I've taken in starting this industry. But Frank, he just, he, he laid it all on the line. I mean, I did too, but I think you did more than me. And... He's also a non-stopper, okay? So he drags his butt up to the studio all the way from Delray, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I listen, I look forward to this. I, we did it two years ago, and I had it in my calendar for two years. <laughs> but times have changed because you came in when you wrote a book, which was not your first book. No, the last book was Aspire, How to Create Your Own Reality and Alter Your DNA, which we were on a big nationwide book tour for. I think you were the last stop on that book tour. Uh, that book did fantastic, and then I wrote a new one. Yeah, well, I waited for you to be done with it. It can't be having you on constantly. Well, <laughs> I mean, we, we, and right, <laughs> we, we wrote that book. We, we toured that 27 cities in 26 days, delivering the message of hope found in my new book called Adversitology, Overcoming Adversity When You're Hanging On by a Thread. Which you know about. We all know about it. Yeah. Everybody watching this knows and has endured some form of physical, financial, spiritual, or relational adversity. If you haven't, you will. And I had a uh, health adversity that I kept secret from all but five people. I was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. I was diagnosed with a, a disease that was supposed to have taken my life. Right. And I implemented this, this plan, this program, this nine-step <coughs> program that I invented uh, that is called the Adversity, A-D-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y, nine steps, nine chapters. Each step will get you closer to, I can't help you avoid adversity, but I can get you through it quicker and with less pain. And so now, two plus years later, completely free of the intruder that entered my bloodstream, and I want to help other people overcome either that physical adversity, financial adversity, you know, bankruptcy, losing a, you know, your job or losing your business, or relational adversity, because we're all going to suffer them. Yeah, we, call, you know, I, I know adversity. I've actually lived it, and I call it people's trauma because we all have trauma in our lives. And you know, I sit on a crisis line, and I, I, for me, it's so important. And I think my success is related back to giving back. Mm -hmm. And I know you do a ton of that also. But let's go back to the beginning before we even start. When you were doing you were hanging on by a thread financially, <laughs> yeah, and you took some major risks, yeah, okay, um, and if I remember correctly, you were um, a caddy at a golf course. I was a maintenance worker. Maintenance worker. Yeah, at a golf digging course. sand traps on that golf course. <laughs> okay, I remember that. Mm -hmm. And you were seeing these people with money and success, mm -hmm. and you wanted to be one. <laughs> Yeah, so the back quick backstory is I'm just a corn-fed country boy from Indiana. I'm the oldest of six, lived in a small town on a farm called Carmel, Indiana, or in Carmel, Indiana. Went to four high schools in four years. I had, was in juvenile detention seven times before I was 18. So my parents were eager to kind of say, get that one-way plane ticket and get out of town because I was in, you know, influencing the, my five younger brothers and sisters in the wrong way. And so, yeah, my first job when I landed at 18 was digging sand traps on a golf course by hand, like digging holes so we could pour the white sand in it, right? That's what a, a sand trap's made out of. So the rich people could avoid hitting their little white ball into the hole I just dug. <laughs> but it was fascinating to me. A, they would pay me to do that. And B, I saw these people playing golf all day. It, they never seemed to work. You and I are old enough to remember a program on TV called Lifestyles of Rich and Famous. Loved it. If you're younger, MTV Cribs. Very similar program. And it's the voyeuristic look inside the lifestyles of those who are rich and famous. And I wanted it. Who doesn't want it? But how are you going to get it when you have no network, no friends, no money, no education? I came out of high school with a 1.8 GPA. But I went to school on these wealthy people that were playing golf in the morning. And then I was moved to the tennis court to work in maintenance there. I became a tennis instructor. That was my license out of poverty, my little my PhD out of out of you know digging sand traps. And the same people who were playing <coughs> golf in the morning were playing tennis in the afternoon. I taught them how to hit a better forehand and backhand. They taught me to invest in real estate, and that's where I earned that PhD in entrepreneurship. That master's in real estate was on the tennis court. It's interesting that you mentioned lifestyles that are famous because, like you, I used to watch it religiously. I wouldn't even go out, 
And mm -hmm. there's one episode with a gentleman named Adnan Khashoggi. Yes. Okay. Sure. The Triad America is what he owned. I had just started in real estate. I, as soon as I saw the episode, I penned off a letter to him. Did you really? Yes. Wow, Khashoggi. Right. He was the richest man in the world, I think, at the time. Yes, yep. And I got a response. Not a response That's I would want, but I got a response better than That's nothing. Yeah. But you're right. Sometimes you got to go after it when you see somebody else having stuff, stuff that you want. He had, to, he had the largest yacht on the seas at the time. Mm -hmm. And it, that was the, it was actually used in James Bond movie. And um, you're right, just watching some of these people and what they have. And it's not that I wanted all of that. I just wanted to go to the mailbox and not see a bill that I could... Uh, I, could, I want to see a bill that I could pay you without pay. thinking about it. Right. <laughs> okay? I think success turned to be, hey, I'm going to buy a desk, but I don't have to put it together myself. That's when you achieve success. Right. Okay? Right. When you have to right. build it yourself. So real estate was the answer, and it was my way out of the living the humdrum life of having to chase bills constantly. Yeah. You know? So I kind of get that. So... You get out of this, and if I remember correctly, and I'm old, so remembering is kind of hard <laughs> for me. You bought a either foreclosure or a, a crack house, piece yep. of crab house. Yeah, a crack. That was a crack. Not, not a crack foundation, like a crack cocaine house, right? right. It was a drug dealer's <laughs> right. house that it was abandoned. It had used condoms and used needles, and it was just a disaster. It, I had to put a mask on to walk in that house, even before, way before masks were a thing. I wore a mask inside this house. But that day, when I walked in that house, I took a yellow pad of paper, I split it down the middle, wearing that mask, I decided to become a real estate artist. Like, I decided to take that crack house and make it the nicest little house on the block. I over-improved it. I put three coats of paint on when most people are putting, you know, one coat of paint. I'm putting grass sod instead of grass seed. I'm putting a new roof instead of just patching the roof. And I, listen, I might look like a artist i cannot sing i can't play an instrument i can't sculpt i can paint a little bit but i build three-dimensional art that people can live in so for 10 years no i'm sorry for five years i didn't do a house worth more than 100 grand i did a bunch of them and i got really good at the craft of real estate not the business but the craft of real estate after doing so many houses uh under 100 grand i jumped from a hundred thousand dollar house to a house that was worth 2.2 million there was nothing in between because i felt i had enough confidence in the craft of this business called real estate to not waste any time going from 100,000 to 200,000 to 500,000. We jumped right on the ocean. This was in 1993, so 30 years ago. And since then, we have created, built, or renovated, mostly built from the ground up, 44 oceanfront houses. So, okay, so I'm going to stop for one second. So you went from 100 grand to 2.2 million. Right. When you went to 100 grand to 2.2 million and you did that investment, if that investment had failed, you would have been digging ditches again? Yeah, no, I was a tennis pro at the time. I okay. was making 100 grand a year as a tennis instructor, so I always knew that I could fall back on that. Okay. I could always make, you know, at 21, 22, I was making 100 grand a year. I bought a Ferrari from teaching tennis. I knew I had that. That was kind of like my diploma that I put up on the shelf. You know, right. like some people that are entrepreneurs take their diplomas and they don't, they don't do anything with it. They got it from the college, but they go start their own business. I had that diploma in the form of being a, a certified teaching professional. But the reason I knew that first project wasn't going to sink or, or go bankrupt or lose money was I didn't over leverage. Uh, as a speculator, debt is a four-letter word. Debt is an obscene four-letter word if you're a speculator, meaning I build a house without a buyer in mind. I don't know if I'm going to eat at Ruth Chris Steakhouse or out of a dumpster. I don't know if I'm going to get paid tonight or in three years. So that's a, kind of a stressful way of living. But the way to relieve a lot of that stress was I didn't over leverage. So, so at mo with most of my projects, I would never put in more than, or borrowed, I should say, more than 60%. I would, so, so how did you get to the equity, Frank? All those little houses I was selling, at the end, we were making 25 grand a house. 25 grand on a $100,000 investment. That's a great return. And I would bank that money. I'm a lot less exciting than I look. I don't party. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't stay out all night. I save my money. And I took the equity from a bunch of hundred thousand dollar transactions, put in that first first house cost me seven hundred and fifty grand. I put four hundred thousand dollars down and borrowed the rest. That's where if I knew I was wrong and maybe I over improved it or overpriced it, I had enough room to not lose everything. And we made you know we made a couple hundred grand in that first house. But from that point forward, we've done forty three direct oceanfront houses with an average selling price of around fourteen and a half million. 
I know that I remember the first time I met you was at an event. I don't know who was running this women empowerment group. I don't know if it was April Iana's own. Do you know April? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't April. Um, but I, I used to film at all the women empowerment, and that's the first time I met you. And I remember you on stage, and I remember, I guess, on a screen, there was a picture of this house that you built that again it was probably 14 million dollars and you had no buyer mm -hmm. at that point but you knew this was the house the right house it was in a, i think it was in a magazine maybe mm -hmm. and that it would sell and you you just carried an air of confidence even though most people would have been going oh my god a 14 million dollar house that i've got to carry you didn't that didn't even seem to upset you nothing you just drove right through the um, talking on stage with total confidence that you knew exactly what you were doing. And, and let me tell you where, I, I don't know, you know, that's great that you perceive that, but where that, where that was derived from is exercising my wrist tolerance like a muscle. Exercising my wrist threshold like a muscle. Because if you do that in life, I don't care if you're in real estate or what line of work you're in, you have to take risks. And we are, the first thing that we think about when we think about taking a risk maybe a big change or big challenge in life, is we become fearful. So risk, let's think. I'm going to do a $10 million house, or I'm going to leave the tennis court and do a $100,000 house. It's the thought of taking the risk that evokes the fear. Once you take the risk, the fear goes away. So when I was doing these projects, like a, I don't know, like Van Gogh or Renoir or Monet, I built three-dimensional art that you could live in. I didn't hang it on the wall like a Van Gogh. You could live in my art. And so 44 houses sounds like a lot, Wayne, but I did that over a 30-year span. It's only a house and a half a year. So we would, just, just like an artist, I would put everything, all the houses were completely unique. They, even the plans, I had to destroy them after we sold them because the owners didn't want them duplicated. So if you have the kind of money that you needed to to buy one of my houses, you wanted a, almost like a private resort. And I, I had a knack of knowing what the ultra-wealthy wanted before they knew they wanted it. And the average days that our house sat on the market was about 55 days over the span of those 30 years. Some houses took two years to sell. Some houses sold in two minutes. But I always knew that we, we would find a buyer. Okay, so you did all this stuff, but you didn't take the money and go out party, drink, smoke. You took the money and you gave back to community. Not always community locally, but... What did you do with some of that profit that you made to help others? Yeah, so at, uh, at the kind of the height of my career, but as I was this meteoric rise was taking place, I had lost all the heart in my soul. I became a consumerist, a materialist, an egotist, and I, I realized, you know, I was taking credit for all these successes, um, and I let it go to my head, and I was very depressed. Like I really felt like, you know. I should be on top of the world. I just sold a $14 million house. We were on the cover of Miami Herald. That was where it was. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm like, what, what, I went to my mentor. And I'm like, why do I feel like, I'm not going to curse on air, but why do I feel like crap? Like, I should be on top of the world. I come to Florida with nothing, and I'm doing great. Becoming this consumerist and this, this materialist and the egotist, my, my mentor said, Frank, you found your professional highest calling. Like, what you do for a living, this is a gift God gave you. You're really good at it. Keep doing it. What's your spiritual highest calling? You're providing housing to the world's most wealthy. Why don't you provide housing to the world's most desperately poor and homeless? That's where I was pulled out of my depression. I started the Caring House Project Foundation, where we did start domestically by buying houses that used to be crack houses, and instead of flipping them, I would rent them for a dollar a month to elderly homeless people. That's how Caring House was started. Uh. And then in 2002, we went to Haiti, and we have now since built 30 self-sustaining villages in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere housing over 13,600 kids that were, if I had a hamburger in my head, they were eating dirt flavored with bouillon and lemon juice. It looks like meat. It's like a mud patty. But now we are providing those children with a self-sustaining existence, and that allowed me to find the spiritual highest calling, which then reinvigorated my professional career. So you're building that stuff. You're still building uh, expensive homes. When did you start the thought that, hey, I'm going to write a book. Well, the first book came out 20 years ago. 
Okay. Make it big. Forty Nine Secrets for Building a Life of Extreme Success came out almost exactly twenty years ago, and I used to give keynote speeches or go give commencement speeches or wherever I would be asked to talk. And in the top pocket of my jacket, I had this little piece of paper, and it had forty nine philosophies that I live by. And I would, if I was talking to a like a kindergarten class, I would talk about one thing. I was talking to a business class, I'd pick a few philosophies. And somebody came up to me and says, let me see that piece of paper. And I showed it to me. You need to turn that into a book. So two, almost three years later, Make It Big came out after it was rejected from 14 publishers. I couldn't even get a, an agent to take the book. But I was on the cover of USA Today, and I mentioned in the article that I had an unpublished manuscript. Wiley and Sons out of New York picked up the, the manuscript. And uh, I, have done, I did two books with them, and I've done six books. I did four books with Health Communications, Inc., and then most recently, I bought the rights to those four books back, and now I self-publish all of them because you're looking at it on the screen. Here's another copy here of Adversitology. Every book that I write, Wayne, provides a hundred, a minimum of a hundred meals in one of our orphanages. I make no money from my books. I make my money in real estate. But knowing that when not only we sell a copy, provides a hundred meals, but when we get out on the road and we tour these things, I don't go to TV stations and, well, I do, but I don't just go to TV stations, bookstores, and podcasts. I go to homeless shelters. I dragged you here. Well, there's one of the places we go to, <laughs> but, but typically we go to homeless shelters, soup kitchens, food pantries, detention seven centers, abused women's facilities, and veterans facilities, even treatment facilities, to deliver the message of hope. And most of my books, at least the nonfiction books, have some underlying message of hope. So, adversitology, overcoming adversity when you're hanging on by a thread. You know, I don't know if you can zoom in on the image there, but look at that hand, hang, you know, hanging on by a thread. That's us when we're going through adversity. And we, who but people, there you can see it right there. Look, look at the hand just barely hanging on. I mean, who's barely hanging on more than m most of the population? People in homeless shelters. So, talk about getting the message that people need to hear it. We, when we got back, we, I, I counted, we were in front of about 3,500 homeless people. That's, I mean, uh, it takes a certain kind of person <clears throat> to overstep their own world to help other people. Putting, a lot of people would just want to make money, make money, make money, make money, and never add anything back to society, to community. And there's something about the feeling of success, but there's something also about the feeling about seeing other people succeed. In your case, seeing kids that were eating mud, eating food. Now they're food. eating two part protein, one part <clears throat> carbohydrate. So, yes, and, um, you know, I, we all go through, like I said, our, tra our traumas. Everybody knows, you know, I was sexually abused as a kid. I sat on a crisis line. I'm constantly giving back to new entrepreneurs who don't have the money. I help them out. You know, I have a brick and mortar. Obviously, I can't. FPNL doesn't say, "Oh, good, you help. You don't have to pay any uh, right. electric." You know, but <clears throat> there's a feeling that you get. I can't explain it when you see people succeed that you helped out, and you cannot buy that feeling. You know, I take it one step further. This don't let this turn you off if you're not into the Bible. You could be agnostic, atheist, Hindu, Muslim, Jew. This could be a fortune cookie saying, for that matter. But it is in the Bible, it's in the Gospel of Luke, and it says, To whom much is entrusted, much is given. To whom much is given, much is required. Right? To whom much is given, much is expected. That's a great life mantra, regardless of where it comes from. That's true. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. It's a stewardship. It's a calling. It's not, a, it's not even really, to me, it's not a choice. Like, if you, you've been blessed with the ability to succeed at some level, those blessings aren't meant for Wayne's sole benefit. And I wish they... I wish they weren't so hard on me sometimes, but it won't stop me from doing what I got to do. No, but that's that's where you take this responsibility, this stewardship, very seriously. As do I. It's it's mm -hmm. interwoven into my DNA now, and and I I believe that you know when when we pray for if you pray at all, you're you're praying for some form of more. Just inventory your prayer tonight: more health, wealth, love, peace, happiness, joy, what have you. Well, what are you doing with the more you already have? And once. God realizes you're a responsible steward for the blessings you already have. Guess what happens to your territory? It gets broadened. It gets widened. So, hell, I come out of high school with a one point eight GPA and, and the revolving door of the juvenile detention center. God gives me the gift to build these beautiful houses and sell them for tens of millions of dollars. You better believe I'm going to be a responsible steward for that blessing that he gave me. And in turn, 
as a simpleton, as a linear thinker with that one point of GPA, providing housing to the wealthy? Okay, Frank, that's great. Why don't you provide it to the mo world's most desperately poor and homeless in a country that nobody wants to go to in Haiti? And especially now, very dangerous. But we've been there 20 years and we've built 30 villages and, and we're not stopping. There's got to be, when you go there, there's got to be this amazing feeling that runs through you when you see not what you did, but the results of what you did, how many people are blessed by it. The, the, the amazing feeling comes in the form of gratitude for the awareness to use my blessings the way I have. I'm very grateful for that. I don't, listen, I, I got past the stage of feeling good about what I'm doing because if you just, you know, give and share just for a, a, a feeling good, you're, you're actually, that's not altruism. You're trading a feeling for money or what have you. I, I don't go back now when I come back. I don't feel any better. I don't feel any worse. I just feel like I've fulfilled my responsibility as a responsible steward for those blessings I've been given. And when we go, we haven't been in a couple of years because it's very dangerous in Haiti right now, we would bring 50 to 60 Americans over there. That they would donate to come, you know, come with us on the trip. They would build a single house. I can build a house in Haiti, by the way, for five grand, a whole house, a concrete house for a family of eight for $5,000. They would donate the money and they would see how kind of, they, they would see the before picture. These people are living in mud huts covered with palm fronds for a roof. Rodents the size of cats running around the floor gnawing on the children's fingers and toes as they sleep. To go from that to a small, I mean, basically a little bit bigger than this room, concrete house, where these people can now live a self-sustaining life. And showing that to other people, like my donors, I got a lot of joy out of that. Because then they saw that, that this consumeristic life, like pursue, like you said, the money, the money, the, th the energy we put into pursuing things, either like new cars and clothes or money, never returns the favor. Notice that. The energy we put into pursuing material things will not return the favor for very long. Some people buy a new car and they've got over it before the first tank of gas is gone. Right. Because it's like an addiction. No, no, I, I drive, well, today I had to come up here because I had double knee replacement. I went in Uber, but I drive a Yugo. You know this. Like, that's my daily driver. <laughs> it's not a hobby car. It's like I've been driving a Yugo since 2006 because I really, you know, it, it doesn't, spending a bunch of money on a car is just not my thing. Well, you know, and I kind of get that. I drive a Kia that's at, I was out front because it has a flat tire, but <laughs> I would never buy a new car, okay, because the money is better spent elsewhere. And not you, but you can be at my house, and I can be at my house. We can leave at the same time. I'll drive my Kia. You drive your Ferrari. We're going to get to this <laughs> studio the exact same time. Not, and I might beat you here because you might get a ticket. Right. Okay? <laughs> so I might be, beat you here. I, that was never my thing. And I did that already. I chased yeah, the bills. We've all done it. I had 40, you know, not compared to what you do. I had a 4,300 square foot home with a pool inside in Jersey. Big deal. Yeah. You know how many times I used that pool in the four years I lived there? Three. Because I had to pay bills and I had to work. My life is so simple now yeah. simple compared to better. what it was. All right, and the simple, the better. And it, it, it affords me the privilege to do things that I like to do, okay, which is sad to say sometimes give back because I most times give back more than I have to give. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. I, I drive... Uh, twice a week, once to Cheddar's and once to Longhorn, I pick up the food that they can't use anymore, and I then bring it to food pantries and stuff. That's, I mean, well done, my good and faithful servant, as St. Peter will say when you okay. go into heaven. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so, um, and I don't, you know, I always say most people have no clue about me, you know, I'm a parrot head, I'm a bum, okay? I'm just a bum that likes to do and see people succeed. I have people come here, don't have any money, they need marketing. Uh, they were told this price, that price. Uh, you know what? I'm still not a charity. You can't afford it. Something for nothing has no value if mm -hmm. someone has money. So you know what? Give me a couple of dollars and then you can pay it off whenever you want. And then a lot of times they don't even pay it off. But you know what? It didn't matter. They got what they needed to get ahead. Um, I used to do Kids Night Out on Broadway. I take 25 to 50 kids to see a play at either Kravitz Center or Broward Center. I would get a hug. You can't buy that. Right. Okay. We take them to CeCe's Pizza. We got T-shirts, and I sat at home and ironed 
uh, Kids Night Out on Broadway and the name of the show. I gave all the kids. I went to the dollar store, bought a bunch of little dollar gifts. Mm. I gave them a bag of stuff. That's great. Took them to see the play. I took them to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in Broward Center. 50, 47 kids. And Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is super long. Only the three-year-old girl <laughs> was awake to the very end. Wow. And she came wow. out and hugged me, and you can't buy that. Yeah, that's beautiful. So... And they go through their own universities because they're in a group home or whatever. Right. All right, let's talk about your book. I know that it's, I know that, I believe that I know that everything that you do, that I know you to do, you kind of do from the heart. Mm -hmm. And to pass on knowledge and stuff that you've been through, <clears throat> and I understand that as a survivor of sexual abuse, I'm on the phone at a crisis line talking people off the roof. So, I know that some things, things that we do, we do because, not that it gives us pleasure, but it gives us satisfaction that we're doing the right thing. So you wrote a book that's sitting up there. Let's talk about that book. Yeah, so adversitology, which is a made-up word, by the way, but you understand what it means. Adversitology is, an enology is the study of biology, you know, theology, geology. Adversitology is the study of adversity. I can now say firsthand, going through financial adversity, that's one thing. Relational adversity, another. But when you go through a health adversity, as you know, none of those other adversities compare. That's correct. Being diagnosed with a death okay. sentence on um, March 11th, 2020. That was the day the country was shut down with COVID, is the day I'm diagnosed. So as I'm withering away, lo losing... I think I lost at the height 30 pounds. I, I talk about, I even show pictures in the book. I lost most of my hair. I was wearing wigs. Thank God I have a, you know, kind of an unusual hairstyle. I could put a wig on and nobody really thought anything of it. <laughs> but I, I kept this to me. I mean, I told like my mother, my spiritual advisor, my um, therapist. I, I kept it from my whole family. Because I wanted to implement a program that was going to get me through to the other side of this adversity, this health adversity, this death sentence. And as I started to see the light at the end of the tunnels, when I started to say, wow, imagine the number of people going through adversities, health, relational, financial, what have you. What if I could get you to the other side quicker and with less pain? Not, I can't help you avoid it. What if I get you there quicker? So you take the nine letters of adversity, A-D-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y. There's nine chapters, A chapter, accept except, and I'm not going to go through all of it, D, disidentify. The, the demons we fight are the demons we empower. The things we renounce are the things we give energy to. So I quit fighting my disease and accepted it and understood it. V, violate fate. Violate fate. I'll stop on that one, then you got to buy the book to get the other chapters. Violate fate <laughs> says there's well-meaning and well-intentioned, well-meaning people in your life that will project their fate upon you as you're going through an adversity might be a lawyer helping you with your bankruptcy or, or your divorce, might be a doctor in my case. I chose to create my own reality, listen to my collaborators, but I was going to violate the fate that they projected on, upon me and create my own. So when you're going through an adversity, you're, you are hanging on by the thread as it shows on the cover of that book. I want you to realize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And this is a shorty, man. This is 100 and, I don't know, 86 pages. My last book was 370. Uh, by the time you finish reading this, adverse, by the way, you go to adversitology.com, adversitology.com. There's free chapters there, okay? There's free Audible chapters. We did something different with Audible that had never been done before. Because my wife and daughter contributed to this book, they are, their voices are part of the Audible recording. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I, record, I wrote this book in third person because I didn't want to associate with the disease, yet my journal entries are in first person. So when you're listening to this, in first, when I'm talking to you in first person, my journal entry, it's like this echoey sound. I'm inside your head, and then I jump to third person, and my wife. It is an experience unlike anything. I, I'll give you an example. My Aspire book. For every 10 Aspire copies we sold, Aspire, How to Create Your Own Reality and Alter Your DNA, uh, seven were, were read, by, you know, like a book, hard copy or soft copy. Three were audible. 50% of this book, because the audible is so different, 50% of the copies being sold, are audible versions. That's, I mean, that's pretty amazing. You said something, and I want to go back to it for a second. You said you only told five people. Yeah. Okay. And what I get is that if you tell too many people, you're going to get too much input, and some of that input is useless. 
and some of that use is is detrimental, in my opinion. You're absolutely right. I listen. I didn't. I didn't keep it to myself for any other reason other than I didn't want to give it energy. Like I, yes, I'm a Christian, but I didn't want prayer groups. I don't want get well cards. I don't want a room full of balloons. I don't want plasma donations. I'm going to do this on my own. And as I concocted this plan to get through it and healthily through it, then I wanted, then I came out and told everybody. And I, I could get away with that, Wayne, by not telling anybody because we were in the height of COVID. We no. were locked down. <laughs> so as I'm disintegrating, nobody could see me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> We're getting to the top of our time, and, and there's so much more we want to discuss. Are, are you in a rush to get back down to well, Delray? I, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm not really in a rush. i got to take an Uber back because I can't drive with my new knees yet. Okay, so can you wait? I have uh, another interview to do, short interview to do, and then I want to come back and go over some of the rest of the book with you. Sure, I'll wait. Everybody, we'll be right back.